Hello everyone, in this video I'm going to show you how to refute the Black Mar Deemer Gambit. If you don't know what that is, it comes after pawn to d4, we play pawn to d5, and now white goes pawn to e4 here, and there's actually a second way to get to this gambit, and that is through the Scandinavian defense with pawn to e4, we play pawn to d5, and now white plays pawn to d4 here. And what white is doing in this gambit is sacrificing the e-pawn for more development and trying to attack us before we can get developed and safe. But it is considered a dubious gambit, and I'm going to show you exactly why in this video and how to get a much better position in every single variation. I'll start off with the main line, and then I'll look at all the little side gambits that white can try to play as well. All right, so let's get Get started. So, white has just played pawn to e4, uh, sacrificing the pawn, and we're going to accept the gambit. We will capture, and now white will try to develop and attack this pawn at the same time with knight to c3. This is their best move, attacking the pawn, and we're going to defend it with knight to f6. We defend the pawn like this, and now white will play pawn to f3. They're threatening to capture us, so we are pretty much forced to capture them. And now white will capture back with the knight. They can also try to play queen takes on f3, which is the rider gambit. I will cover this afterwards as well. But knight takes on f3 is the main move. And the move you want to remember here is bishop to f5. I think this is only like the 5th or 6th most common move, but it is the best move in this position and it is the best try to get a much better position against white. So, white now has two main moves here, those being bishop to c4, which is a lot more popular, or bishop to d3, which isn't as good. If they play this, then we're going to trade. They will take back their queen, and now you simply play pawn to c6 to prevent any queen to b5 shenanigans, so that will just never be a problem for you, and you're going to play this in pretty much the same way as the main line, which is bishop to c4 here. Attacking the f7 pawn, or I shouldn't say attacking, but sort of putting pressure on, and here you're going to play pawn to e6. A sort of double purpose move, opening up your bishop for development as well as blunting this bishop from seeing the f7 pawn, white will castle here, and instead of the main move, bishop to e7, I am not going to recommend this here because white can try pawn to d5, and even though this isn't as common, you just don't really want to deal with this and start having to deal with uh, this pawn attacking this, whatever. You don't have to deal with any of this. Instead, I recommend to simply play pawn to c6 here. So now you really clamp down on the d5 square and you prevent any shenanigans on that. And now white will play a very tricky knight to e5. Or knight to g5 here, they are pretty much the same move. And this actually is a very secretive tactic that white is threatening and you only have one move here. And that move is a bishop back to g6. This is the only good move here because if we play something else like a bishop to e7, which so many people have fallen for, then white simply wins with either rook takes on f5, the idea being that after we capture back, now knight takes on f7 and we simply get forked. Or they can play an immediate knight takes on f7, which is just as good. And after we capture back, now they capture here. Uh, we cannot capture because the bishop pins. And that is pretty obviously just not very good. So instead, you want to play bishop to g6. That way, this pawn is now defended by the bishop, so those tactics are now completely gone. And here, white are really starting to have trouble coming up with the compensation for the pawn, and black scores really well here. White will probably play bishop to g5, and you simply want to go bishop to e7. Uh, undo this pin, just, uh, you know, not letting white have any chances against you. And after something like queen to d2, you simply develop your knight. Knight b to d7 here. Uh, white will probably capture your bishop. And if they capture a bishop, this is not a bad thing for you. You're simply going to capture back the pawn. Uh, this is a pretty good example of when double g pawns are not a bad thing. And after something like rook a to e1, 
you simply want to castle here. Your king is completely safe despite these doubled pawns here, uh, but you are still up a pawn in this position, and white really has almost no compensation here. Uh, this knight will head to b6, uh, and you will try to get a knight to d5. If you can get a knight to d5, you're just going to have a very good position, and I don't really know what else to say, but you just have a very good position here. You're up a pawn, and you are doing very well. So, that is the main line, but now I will start to look at all the little side gambits that white can attempt to play as well. The first one I will look at is a here. After we capture the pawn, instead of white playing knight to c3, they play an immediate pawn to f3 here. This is the Jadolt Gambit, and you don't really have to memorize that much here. If they play this, you can play pawn to e5 and try and give the pawn back to get into some end game where you're slightly better. That's the best according to the engine, but I'm going to recommend to simply capture the pawn. Uh, white will take back, and now you want to go bishop to f5 here. Uh, take control of this diagonal immediately, and after something like bishop to c4, and now pawn to e6, more than likely, I bet in like 90% of your games, this will end up transposing back into the mainline position, and you already know what to do from there. So, pawn to f3 immediately is not a very challenging try. Uh, so now knight to c3, we go knight to f6, and now white plays bishop to g5 here. This is the Von Popiel Gambit, funny name, uh, and what they're doing here is essentially threatening to capture our knight. Uh, yeah, well, I can't do it here, but threatening to capture our knight, and after we take back, then capture here, at which point they will have regained their pawn. Obviously, we don't want to allow that, so we will go bishop to f5. Defend the pawn, and a white plays pawn to f3 here, and this is going to become pretty similar to the main line. Uh, if they ever capture, you can simply capture back with your pawn. Uh, either pawn works here, but I like capturing back the e-pawn. You open up your bishop, and you simply have a fine position here. But the main move is pawn to f3 here. And a very important note, you cannot capture in this position. And you might think, oh, well, just knight takes back, and this is pretty much the same as the main line, right? The answer is no, because they can actually take back their queen, and they're threatening both our bishop and our pawn over here. So you have to play an awkward, like, queen to c8, defend the bishop, defend the pawn, and this is just pretty awkward. You don't really want to play this. Instead, I'm going to recommend knight to d7 here. Defending your knight with another knight, and after something like bishop to c4, now you want to play pawn to c6. That way, if the queen ever heads to f3 after we capture, our b7 pawn is no longer under attack because the pawn on c6 is in the way. Uh, so after something like queen to e2 here, now we capture, white captures back, pawn e6, and like long castles and bishop to e7. Once again, you get a position where, yeah, white has some development, but you will castle, you're up a pawn, and white does not have that much compensation. So bishop to g5 is a pretty strong try by them, but you still get a better position. Now let's look at the last one, which is the rider gambit, and that is in this position, now pawn to f3, we capture, and instead of taking with the knight, they actually take with the queen. This is the rider gambit, and essentially what white is doing is sacrificing the d4 pawn to try and get a ton of development, but this is actually pretty bad for them because we can just capture the pawn anyways. And now white will go bishop to e3, uh, attack our queen, and you don't want to move it to b4 because then white can long castle here and they get their dream of having a ton of development for the two pawns. Instead, you're going to let them have no fun by playing queen to h4 check. We check their king, so they have to play an annoying move like pawn to g3, and now you simply want to slide your queen over to g4. Now, you're offering a trade to them, and if they ever uh, trade, like for example, if they trade here, you can simply take back the bishop, and trading queens for them is very bad because you're, you're, you're up two pawns here. If you trade into an endgame, your two pawn advantage is going to become much bigger. So, if they play like long castles here, 
you can simply capture, trade queens, and now to prevent any knight to b5 shenanigans, simply go pawn c6, and you're simply up two pawns here, and white has like barely any compensation, and because we've traded queens, almost all of their attacking potential has gone to waste. Their best try is probably queen to f2 here to try and prevent any trades, but you simply want to go queen to f5. Offer another trade here, uh, if they capture, you can just capture back, a good position, and if they play like knight to f3, then now you can go knight to g4 here, fork their queen and their bishop, and you simply have a very good position here. Like if they move their queen over, you can simply capture, they capture back, and after something like pawn to e6 here, they really just have almost no compensation for the two pawns. Alright, so that is how to essentially refute the Black Mardemer Gambit. Maybe not completely refuted, but you can get a pretty convincing advantage in every single line. Uh, thank you so much for watching, uh, like, subscribe, do all that stuff, and I hope you have a fantastic day. I'll see you next time.